today is Jedediah. Turn your, your neighbor and say, my name is Jedediah. <laughs> We're talking about the person of Jedediah, who he is from the Bible in just a moment. Before I open the scripture, let me share something humorous. The first service almost booed me, but I know you guys have a better sense of humor. A pastor visited an elderly mem member from his congregation. As he, as he sits on the table, he notices a large bowl of peanuts on the coffee table. Mind if I have a few, he asked. No, not at all, the woman replies. They chat for an hour, and the preacher stands to leave. Suddenly he realizes that he ate almost all the peanuts. I'm terribly sorry for eating all your peanuts. I really just meant to eat a few. Oh, that's all right, the woman says. Ever since I lost my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate off them. I'm getting, I'm getting booed. <laughs> Could have happened. Second chapter, chapter 12. I'm, I, I think I'm going to spend a few weeks really speaking about various incredible kingdom moments in the life of King David. I mean, there's so much life in his story, so much to draw from. And I just can't, lately I've just been really going back and having a wonderful time with the Holy Spirit. But here is one of the things that the Bible does not hide from us the humanity of the people that God uses. It shows us their strengths, it shows us their weaknesses, it shows us their victories, it shows us their defeats, it shows us their godliness, it shows us their sinfulness. And part of the reason for that is, is so that we would never make the false conclusion that someone who's done great things was just a better person than us. You know who does great things? People that have a great God. And so the Bible shows us the, 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 temperance, of, the temperance of people. Here, here's a great insight to David. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19. David saw that his servants were whispering he perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to the servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Just the summation of that. This is f a famous story. Even people that don't know the Bible kind of know about David and Bathsheba. David fell in love with someone else's wife. They had an affair. She became pregnant. David tried to cover it up, couldn't cover it up. So he had the husband of this woman killed, a righteous man killed. And now she's pregnant, and David thought he got away with all of it, except God saw every moment of it. The prophet came in and gave him an incredible word. David responded appropriately. He repented. In fact, his repentance was so sincere, so heartfelt, that he was forgiven. In Psalm 51, God gives the record. David wrote Psalm 51 after the heart-wrenching failure of his life with Bathsheba, his repentance. And so David now is praying. He's prayed for seven days, no food, laying on the floor, the king of Israel, wearing sackcloth, covered with ashes, being laying flat on the floor for one week. He's not praying for God to forgive him. He's praying for God to stop the consequences of his sin. And so that can happen. It's not a guarantee, but David knows God's mercy is unending. So David's appealing toward God's mercy that the, this baby would not suffer because of his sin. But the baby died as the prophet said he would anyways. So what happens in the next verse is so shocking, it reveals the depth of David's character and kingdom principles for us to, to draw from. Verse 20, David arose from the ground. And so I want to say it right now. You're getting back up. This is your get back up season. Now, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have a David's testimony of killing someone or sleeping with someone. 
If the devil knocked you down, if heartache knocked you down, if betrayal knocked you down, if something that went wrong knocked you down, whatever knocked you down, this is your get back up season in Jesus' name. David rose from the ground, washed, anointed himself. We would say put on some cologne and changed his clothes and he went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. His first official action after the greatest failure of his life was to worship God. Wow. Then he went to his own house and he requested some food and they gave him food and he ate it. Then the servant said to him, what is this you've done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And David said, here is his logic. While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me and the child may live? But now he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Now his side piece, Bathsheba. <laughs> his fling is now his wife. Just saying. <laughs> David comforted his wife and slept with her. And she bore a son. And David called his name Solomon, which means peace. Now the Lord loved Solomon. Wow. And the Lord sent word by the hand of Nathan, the prophet who prophesied the death of the child born in adultery. Now prophesies a different word to the son born by a marriage. And the Lord called the name of the baby Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. Can you imagine being so loved, your birth so loved, that God races down and gives you a surname, a, a beautiful heavenly name, Jedediah. Lord, thank you for your word. We celebrate as we open the pages of your word. It lives. It's powerful. Anoint your servant, your word, and your people. Let miracles flow. Let hearts be healed. Let vision be released. Let demons be destroyed. Show the devil who is boss. In Jesus' name, amen. Just four points. Number one, David arose from the ground. It is in the DNA of every believer that God has planted the DNA of Christ in you. And that is a part of that DNA, a part of that spiritual makeup is divine resilience. A bounce back factor. Human beings have it just because we're in the image of God. When we're born again, that image is magnified and purified and amplified. And, and I just want to sell, tell you this, no matter where life takes you and no matter what happens to you, you're going to make a comeback. You're going to get back up. It's in you. The difference between a victim, victim, victims stay down, overcomers get up. They experience the same thing. The victim says, I can never recover from that. The overcomer says, I'm getting back up. Micah 7 verse 8 says this, Rejoice not against me, O thou mine enemy. When I fall, I will arise. Let me just tell you my future. I'm getting back up. Proverbs 24 says, The righteous man, though he may fall one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, will arise again. Now that's a bad week. Seven times or seven days in a week. So Monday failed, Tuesday failed, Wednesday failed, Thursday failed. A whole week of falling. But the devil didn't win because it was a whole week of getting back up. 
And so no matter what happens in your story, the, you know, God, God doesn't call perfect people. There aren't any. There are no perfect people. There's just us. And so in our story, one way or another, by human weakness, by satanic temptation, by difficult adversities, people, we stumble, we fall, but we get back up. And this is your I'm getting back up season. This is your God's not done with you, the best is yet to come season. This is your the devil's a liar, I'm not going to stay down season. Now never grant a negative emotion permission to be permanent in your life. Psalm 30 says it like this, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let me just help you. It's morning time. Joy's here. The idea of that verse is that joy, joy doesn't come politely knocking on the door. Um, hello, do, do you have any rooms open? Joy comes and evicts grief. I'm sorry, you're in my room. You got to leave. I'm taking over. And so that's the inheritance of God. Now, grief is not a sin. In fact, Grieving, mourning, experiencing sorrow because of loss is the normal, healthy response to experiencing loss. When people don't go through a grieving season, when they stuff it down, all they do is uh, sentence themselves to some future explosion, medically or psychologically or relationally. And so it's good to process things and go through grief. It's good to not run from it, hide it, or pretend we don't have it. But, but the, the problem with grief is it's never supposed to be a life sentence. So, so, so you, you have to get this. Grief is the normal healthy response to loss, but it's never supposed to be a life sentence we can't escape from. I'm sorry for what you've been through. I'm sorry for the losses, the death of a family member, the, a bankruptcy, a betrayal, a divorce, a heartache, whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for all those things. Life is filled with some difficult moments. But, but I just want to say to you, in the kingdom of God, you have an option to get out of the prison of grief. <laughs> we just did, I, I know, I know Pastor Judy and Dr. McCray can remember these days. We, we used to judge people in Pentecost by how miserable they were. And the more miserable you are, the more spiritual you are. Oh, she's so spiritual. Look how miserable she is. <laughs> and, and people would carry grief, either the burden of God or the hardships of life. But, but God wants you to be so healed, people can't even tell what you've been through. I, Isaiah says like this. When you walk through the waters, you won't drown. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. There won't even be the smell of smoke on you. That's what God can do. That's what God can do. Not diminishing the suffering of loss, but telling you the power of God to bring you back. This is your comeback, getting back, season, back on your feet, back with life, back with what God has for you, season, in Jesus' name. Number two, David washed off sath cloth and maybe just the dirt from laying on the floor for a week. And then he washed his face, he washed his body, and then he put on some cologne. He anointed himself and he changed his clothes. So David, that, that, those three things exemplify David saying this, I'm not going to allow one bad chapter of my life to define all the rest of the chapters of my life. I, I, I'm not going to allow this thing a permanent part of my identity. On the ground, he was laying on the ground as a broken man. When he got up, he was a king. He said, go get my palace garment. That's who I am. See, you, you see, life will try to mold us and life will try to make us. And life will try to fashion us into people we were never meant to be. Inside of you is the calling to be like Jesus. Inside of you is the spirit of an overcomer. Inside of you is the person who's supposed to dream great dreams and 
fulfill a destiny and live with passion and live with purpose and have joy and, 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 and be an ambassador for, inside of you. All those things and whatever is stopping you from that identity, God says, I want you to wash that off now. I'm going to take that off. I want you to change your garments. And I know you've been through some things, but that's not who you are. The Bible primarily, by its own self-description, is a book of identity. It's a mirror. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So the Bible tells us who we are. Let me say it like this. You are who God says you are. Not who your past, not who your sin, not who the devil, not who your family, not who your own shame-ridden soul says you are who God says you are and you're his loved beloved child amen no it's so important because in life destiny is the is is the accomplishment of people that walk in identity identity unlocks destiny and it's impossible for you to fulfill God's plan for your life when you don't believe your identity in Christ the way you see yourself determines the way you see everything else. You cannot see life right when you see yourself wrong. I tell people this, the most important thing in life is what you believe about Jesus Christ. All of eternity in your story hinges on who you say Jesus is. But I like to add this in every gospel preaching church believes point number one. But I like to add this little second point. I believe the second most important belief you will ever have is what you believe about yourself. And so God wants you to get it right. Come on, God wants you to believe you're everything Jesus says you are. He wants you to believe you're more than a conqueror. He wants you to believe you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He wants you to believe you're an ambassador for Christ. He wants you to believe you're justified. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, for about who we are in Christ Jesus, we've been made new. If any person is in Christ Jesus, they're a new creation. Old things passed away, all things made new. Verse 21 says, but he the Father made him the Son to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There is no higher righteousness than the righteousness of Christ. You can't get higher than that. And God gave it to you in new birth. The Bible says the spirits of just men made perfect in Rome, excuse me, Hebrews 12. That righteousness is perfect inside of us. Now we want to live it out. We want to be transformed by renewing our minds. We want to live it out with a sanctified life. But the gift of righteousness releases all of those blessings in Christ's name. The third thing David did, and this is shocking, he got dressed because he was going somewhere. And he didn't go to see his wife. He didn't go to see his friends. He went to the temple. He went to church. And he worshiped God. It is such a beautiful revelation of who David was. Even after the greatest heartbreak, heartache of his life, his first response was to worship God. When you can worship God for being good, even while you're going through something bad, you give the devil two black eyes, you create a cognitive dissonance, you create an earthquake in the spirit, and you create change in your world. And David worshiped because he knew some things. Worship heals. The faster, we, remember when David encouraged himself in the Lord is God, what do you think he did? Oh, he was worshiping. The faster we worship, the faster we heal. David understood about the pattern of worship. And David understood if the devil can't stop your worship, he can't steal your breakthrough. David understood that worship takes you places you don't deserve to be and gives you things you don't deserve to have. Worship shuts the mouth of the devil. Worship changes the atmosphere. Worship changes the outcome. Worship changes everything. When we worship God, we enter into a place of miraculous possibilities and personal transformation. I personally believe there's no better therapy on the earth than worship. So many good things and deep things and profound things can happen inside of us when we and while we worship the Lord our God. Keep your worship on. 
Keep your worship on. Come on. David said, I'm going to worship. When you can worship God on your best day, that's good. But when you can worship God on your worst day, that's great. Worship David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. From the mountains and valleys. David knew. David knew. Fourth point. Now, Bathsheba is not his girlfriend, or it's she's his wife. And they have a son. This, this would be over months and over, over years' time, you know, this talk, group of time here. And David names the son Peace. He'd, he'd been through some rough waters there. He names his son Peace. It wasn't as, you know, the devil didn't send that storm. His own sin created the storm. It's, this is David's storm. But he named the son Peace, and he's holding the baby. Bathsheba's holding the baby. Here comes the prophet. Oh, boy. Mr. Good News. Here he comes. He said, the Lord loves your child. There's something special about the tender love of God to us after we've been through the brutal waters of heartache and failure. There's something so healing when God says, receive my beloved, care for you, Jedediah. And I just want to prophesy Jedediah to you. Jedediah in your future, Jedediah, you're about to see a season of favor, of grace, of restoration, of breakthroughs, of healing, of redemption, of transformation, of testimony. There's a Jedediah. But you got to make it out of all the things. you got to repent for your sin. If there was sin, you've got to let God heal your heart. You've got to not, you know, refrain your worship. And if you can make it through this process, my friend, God's written a check. It's impossible to understand a book when you open up in, in the middle and try to discern how it ends. Stop trying to determine the ending when you're just in the middle. Because You'll think this cannot have a good ending, but you don't know God's penmanship. You don't know God's authorship. You don't know God's creative care for you. You don't know God's ultimate plan for you. If it's not good yet, it only means God's not done writing it yet. God's writing a script with your story in it. And so hereafter, his greatest failure comes to his greatest achievement. I suppose if we asked David what was his greatest achievement, he wouldn't say it was killing Goliath. or he, he, he would say it was Solomon. His greatest achievement after his greatest failure. One of beautiful Mary and my favorite verses is Joel 2.25. We stood on that verse when we lost everything. And Joel 2.25 says, I will restore the years to you, says the Lord. Everything the locust has eaten, it talks about four different kinds of locusts or four different ways the locust attacks. The, the, the leaf and the bark and the roots and the tree itself until there's nothing left. And, and God says, I don't care if there's nothing left, I'm going to give you everything back. It, it, you see, if you can make it psychologically, if you can make it emotionally, if you can make it spiritually through the rough patches of life, there's a Jedediah waiting for you. There's, give God the chance to write a good ending to your story. There's a, there's a chapter where people go, wow, how'd that happen? When everyone gives up on you, man, that's the perfect setup for your next Jedediah season. When, when God just shows up and says, this is a season of my great love, my great care, my great favor, and I'm restoring your soul. Isaiah 61, 7 says this. It's a beautiful, it's Isaiah's written to people that have been in prolonged generational captivity, which we can hardly understand as Americans. All kinds of cruel, cruelty and oppression. 
And here's what God says to them. And, and through them to us. Instead, I love the word instead. You with me? I love going out and eat, eat with some of my friends. Some of my friends are just, you know, they, they walk in and you feel like they kind of are co-owning the restaurant. And they'll say, well, I, I, I know it says you got that, but can I have this instead of that? And can you put this instead of that on that? And would you please add this instead? And, and I'm just like, wow, I didn't know you, that was legal. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm just, I just get whatever, whatever they serve me. Oh, okay. And I take off what I don't like. But my friend's like, no. Instead. And God says, I got some insteads for you. Insteads. Instead of your shame. I did a forensic of a life-threatening depression 25 years ago. You know who was the gatekeeper, the, the prison warden of my depression? Shame. I hate shame. It'll take your mental health. It'll take your joy. It'll make you blinded concerning vision. It'll make you lose your identity. It'll give you, it'll steal human dignity. It'll make you unhappy every day of your life. You live with it instead of shame. You know who's going to be in heaven? Bathsheba. The other woman. She'll be in heaven. You know we'll have no shame, Bathsheba. God gave her an instead. Mary and I, when we go out, you know, one of the fun things in life is, is when we're with a couple, we love to ask them, how'd you guys meet? And every now and then it's like, <laughs> they look at each other, can we tell the preacher the truth? Let's make up a better story. How'd you guys meet? Don't matter. Look what God's done. God can take messy beginnings and make them have miraculous endings. C come on. They, David didn't do this right. He didn't find Bathsheba. He wasn't a single guy. He was a married man who fell in love with a married woman and then killed the married woman's husband and thought and, and, and got, you know, got in trouble. And a couple years later, everything's good. When you get your heart right with God, it's amazing what he can do in your world. Instead of shame... Come on, shame, get out of here. Shame, get out of here. Instead of shame, I will give you double honor. Wow. Instead of confusion, they will rejoice in their inherited portion. In the land, therefore, says the Lord, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Oh, look at that. God turns stories around. And that's when a prophet said, get ready for your Jedediah story, your Jedediah chapter. Come on. <clears throat> if Mary's cooking something for me, 30 pounds ago, she used to cook cakes for me. <laughs> Those days are over. She's now my dietitian. She's very good. <laughs> and... What would it be like if the cake's in the oven for 15 minutes, I open the oven door, I pull out the cake and I said, what is this? And I threw it against the wall. And she says, what'd you do that for? Because it was, it, it, it wasn't a cake. And she said, it's because it wasn't done cooking. Don't take the cake out of the oven. Don't. Make the wrong conclusion about the matter when God's still baking something good. Let him cook it. Let him cook it. Let God finish it. 
let God present it. And you won't be disappointed. Thank you for listening to me today, would you? Hey, would you stand your feet, everybody? <clears throat> Lord, we're honoring you for your goodness. I think that song, You Are Good, was Song of the Year. Um, just won a Song of the Year. Our friends at Bethel wrote that. It's just, it's so wonderful to rehearse the goodness of God. You know, Neurologically, our brains are geared toward remembering negative things. Anybody here married? <clears throat> so my wife remembers things. The reason why I don't fight with my wife is I never win. <laughs> so I was, she'll say, well, it was a Tuesday night at 8.15, <laughs> 1983. And you said this to me. I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. <laughs> Our minds remember negative things. They're locked in by trauma. They're locked in. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, intentionally remind yourself. Worship reminds our soul how good God is. Come on. You have to intentionally... The reason why you have to feed yourself good things is because bad things show up automatically. From, and they caused there to be a, a really a distorted perspective of life when, there's, when we forget the good things. God, we will never forget the goodness of God. We love you, Lord. Come on, just tell them you love them. Worship t or prayer team, join me down front. We honor you, we worship you, and praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. All my days you have been faithful. All my life you have been faithful. Come on, tell them this morning. All my life yeah. you've been so good. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Every breath that I am made. Beautiful. Come on, tell them. I, I will, will sing of the goodness. Let's sing it again. God. All my life you have been All faithful. Life, tell them. Listen, as we close, we are a house of prayer because we believe God answers prayer. And the most important thing that we'll pray for today is people here that have never received the goodness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. They've not yet received the gift of salvation. We'd be so honored to pray for you today. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, make this your day. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've been away from God, make today your coming back home day, your getting back up day. Maybe you, you're just hurting in your body or your mind. You say, Pastor, I need a healing. Or maybe you're just going through a season that's just intensely difficult. We're here to pray the prayer of faith and release God's care for you. Anyone wanting prayer, come and join us. Just for 60 seconds longer church worship God with those coming forward. Come forward. All my life. All my life you have been faith. Yeah. All my life you have been so, so There's a person here, you said this this week because you're having physical pain that is interrupting sleep. And the pain is so bad you can't go back to sleep. It's just excruciating pain. And I believe it's in your back, but I just want to tell you, I heard the Lord say he's going to heal you today. And if you say, Pastor, that's for me. I, this week I, I said, Lord, I can't take living with this pain much longer. Wave your hand at me if that's you, because I'm just going to... Would you mind coming forward and let me praying for you? Yeah, is it... 
Is it you? Can, can you come forward? So, Lord, we thank you for healing your daughter. Pastor George, would you come and help me pray for this woman as she comes forward? Thank you, God. I, there's a person here, you, you have suffered with like 22 years of migraines. You've been treated for them. You've had all kinds of different evaluations about them. The God who made your body knows how to heal you from that, that condition. If that's you, wave your hand at me. Say, Pastor, I've been fighting migraines. Yeah, yeah, so great. We're, we're going to, uh, Sherry's going to pray for you right now. Uh, uh, yeah, Sister Ruth, <laughs> Jesus' name. There's another person here. Your, it hurts so bad in your right knee to stand. And there, it's not just the knee. There's something swollen around your thigh above the knee. I saw God touch that and heal that. Wave your hand at me if that's you because we're going to believe God to heal your knee, your right knee. Yeah, yeah. So, Lord, thank you for healing that knee right now in Jesus' name. I declare, brother, you will walk and not grow weary, run and not faint in Jesus' name. That all, everything wrong is healed. That pain leaves and, and full recovery comes to that knee right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. There's a person here. So, when we ask God, if, if your marriage is in a difficult place, when we ask God, you know, for wisdom, He loves you, He knows what's best for you, and He won't fail you in regards to that. And I just want to say, I heard the Lord say, tell someone here today, He's not done with your marriage and He's going to help you. And I, you don't have to raise your hand, but God's going to help you. He's going to help your marriage. And just give him the chance. Lastly, there's someone here, there's, in your family, there's been an outbreak of people interested, not just in false religions, but, but tr real occultism, high-level occultism. In fact, someone calls themselves like a white witch in your family. And we're just going to pray. You know, I, I never curse those people. I always bless them and pray for their salvation. And I see God save them all the time. Last year, I prayed for a prominent witch. God visited her. I had a word of knowledge for her. She, she, was, she became the witch that switched. If that's you, say, Pastor, that's me. I've got someone who's calling himself a white witch in my family. And Yeah, yeah. Uh, keep on, let me pray for you. So, Mary and I love you. You're an amazing church. Stay here as long as you want to. Come forward for prayer. Have a wonderful, blessed week. You're an amazing church. God bless you.